used to happen back in the, the good old pre-COVID days. Um, just a, a couple of announcements. So sorry, I'm confused, confused everything there. Um, oh yes, Monday evening. The meeting to take away all the harvest decorations. Um, after if you have Christmas, you wait about a month, but with harvest, no, it's the next day. So tomorrow night at seven o'clock to collect all your your gear. And then the ladies' group is meeting on Tuesday the 11th, is this Tuesday night, at 8 o'clock, and the speaker is Mrs. Lindsay Farrell. And um, is she going to be talking about habitat for... No, she's not. Her life story, well that's even more interesting, that's fabulous. So um, that'll be a, a good night on, on Tuesday night. And then the midweek is this Thursday evening, just in the hall behind me. And I discovered a new method of doing Bible study, which is incredibly comfortable and non-threatening. So we'll be doing that on Thursday evening. Um, I mean, the new thing is incredibly comfortable and non-threatening, but even more so than usual. Uh, so please do come along to that. Um, and I don't think I have any other announcements. Well, I did want to mention a couple of things. I did send this out on WhatsApp. One is about... This training course that they're doing in RMAP Presbytery the last Tuesday of each month, they're doing it for six months. If you're interested at all, say to me, and I've just got a very simple bookmark with the information, and, and we might go there as a, as a group on the last Tuesday of the month. And then um, I also have an historical society training table, if anybody's interested, I'll try and put some of the lectures from that up on WhatsApp as well. Okay. Let us begin our service problem. Good morning, welcome to Caledon Presbyterian Church and this is a Sunday morning service for both Caledon and Minterburn but this morning it is Caledon's Harvest Service so we're all here to, to celebrate together and I'm not sure if in the recording a little glance can be done around the hall but uh, you, can, you can believe me if you can't actually see it for yourselves that it looks amazing and my favourite part which is always the pillar at the back looks fabulous as always, that's the thing I probably see the most. Um, so a massive thank you to everybody who was involved in putting this together. It just looks amazing. I like to do a little round of applause as a thank you. So I think a little round of applause for everybody who's here. Um, I am now going to very happily hand over to the Sunday School to open our service of worship. <coughs> giving thanks unto the Lord. Giving thanks unto the Lord is a good thing, for the blessings he gives everyone, for the blessings of our families and loved ones, and for his only most precious son. So thank the Lord today, thank the Lord today. He is faithful and his love secure. He is our Father, Provider, and Best Friend. Let us praise our Lord forevermore. Giving thanks unto the Lord is a good thing, because our Lord is worthy of praise. So let our hearts be continually grateful, and remember to thank Him always. So thank the Lord today. Thank the Lord today. He is faithful and His love secure. He is our Father, Provider, and Best Friend. Let us praise our Lord forevermore.
that's lovely. Thank you very much. I was just relaxing there, and then I suddenly realised I probably needed to get up and do something. Thank you very, very much to the Sunday School. Did you, nobody's paying attention to me, did you enjoy getting all that ready? It was a good fun. Everybody's going back to their their seats, or they're like a flock of birds fleeing for the warm summer sun in the gallery. Sunday School teachers, did you enjoy getting all that ready? It was a bit of a rush. <laughs> it was really, thank you so much for all that hard work. It sounded fabulous. Um, we are now going to have a chance ourselves to sing. Obviously, we will not compare to the Sunday School Choir, but we will do our best. They will help us along. So we are going to sing number one. Well, this is very early for me, number 95. Thank we all our God. So 
Lord, forgive us for all our self-focus. Help us to turn to you and to always be thankful. And Lord, we do bring our prayers for others this morning. We bring to you all the families and all who have lost loved ones, who have lost neighbours. Lord, we pray for this very tight-knit community, something uh, probably easy enough for us to imagine. We pray for this very tight-knit community, just stunned by this explosion in what keeps being described as their only shop. Lord, we pray for those who are still in hospital and especially recovering for the person still critically ill in Dublin. And Lord, we do pray for the churches in the area that they will be able to demonstrate in the midst of loss and grief, they will be able to demonstrate the hope and strength of the gospel. And Lord, we pray for those who are grieving after the brutal attacks in the day centre in Thailand and the pain and grief of the families of the 37 who died, including 24 children. Lord, we can't really imagine what that would be like. There are barely words to know what to pray. We pray for support for the families. We pray for families and lives to be rebuilt. And we pray for your light to shine through the darkness. Lord, just take a, a moment to pray for the one little girl, Emmy, who survived miraculously. Lord, help her over the years to deal with the trauma and the loss she has experienced, but does not yet understand. Lord, closer to home, I'm very reliant on, on BBC for all my news, and they're very concerned about the bird flu situation. And so, Lord, we do pray um, uh, for that, which has been particularly bad this year, apparently. Lord, we ask for continued protection from the bird flu in these counties and minimal disruption over the coming months. And Lord, we pray for our own health over the coming months. Lord, so many illnesses doing the rounds and we're barely in October. Help us to be careful, to look out for each other, to take precautions. And Lord, protect those who are feeling particularly vulnerable as we head into the winter. And Lord, we continue to pray for our politicians, for talks about the protocol and Stormont. Lord, all of these things can be unsettling. There is that sense of shifting sand beneath our feet. Lord, we pray and we will keep praying for wise decisions, for you to bring good out of confusion and difficulty, and for us to have confidence in all these things that are happening around us, that you are always the rock beneath our feet. Whatever happens, we can keep looking to you and can keep trusting you because you will look after us and you will make all things right. So help us, Lord, to keep looking to you, to keep our eyes firmly fixed on you, our God and our Saviour. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, in a moment, uh, the choir, well, two minutes and a half, the choir are going to sing uh, for us, uh, Psalm 130, so we're looking forward to that. But just before that, I'm going to read from uh, Leviticus. I've done a bit of a, a deep dive into Leviticus this harvest. So I'm going to be reading Leviticus 2, um, verses 1 to 3, and then verses 11 to 13. So Leviticus is one of the easier books to find, certainly compared to Philippians or Galatians. It's page 102 in your Pew Bibles. It's the third book in the Bible. Um, and I'm going to be uh, reading from verse 1. But I'm afraid I'm going to read a very slightly different version, which I have made bigger so that I can read it. Uh, so mine is a slightly updated NIV version. But reading from verse 1 in Leviticus chapter 2. When anyone brings a great, and the children might want to listen to this, mm -hmm. uh, I might be asking them a question or two about it. When anyone brings a grain offering to the Lord, their offering is to be of the finest flour. They are to pour olive oil on it, put incense on it, and take it to Aaron's sons, the priests. The priest shall take a handful of the flour and the oil, together with the incense, and burn this as a memorial portion on the altar, a food offering, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. The rest of the grain offering belongs to Aaron and his sons. It is a most holy part of the food offerings presented to the Lord. And then verse 11. Every grain offering you bring to the Lord must be made without yeast, for you are not to burn any yeast or honey in a food offering presented to the Lord. You may bring them to the Lord as an offering of the first fruits, but they are not to be offered on the altar as a pleasing aroma. Season all your grain offerings with 
salt. Do not leave the salt of the covenant of your God out of your grain offerings. Add salt to all your offerings. This is God's word. And I'm now going to hand over to the choir.
setting off there really nearly. Um, so if you want to come down to the front, I would sit. Yeah, I know. I'm sitting here using the microphone though. Um, yeah, come down to these front rows here. Just start coming down anyway. Sit, sit for the spirit roots here. Yeah. Um, we don't sit for the spirit roots. Yeah. are 
Scorpius weekly punishment prison grounding, but also in the middle of it all, I think you might avoid some of that if you actually say you're sorry. So we would say we're sorry. We say we're sorry to the person, but who else would we say we're sorry to? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Lord, we would also say sorry to God. Well, they didn't really do that kind of thing. They would bring what they called offerings to this place called the tabernacle. These are all bits. They're all off there. Good images. So they would bring offerings to the tabernacle, and that would be their way of saying to God that they were sorry. So worship looked really, really different. So I thought I would bring one of the sorts of offerings with me this morning, okay? Sorry, I'm going to balance this so I can... So they had lots of different types of offerings. I'm going to give you some examples. The first is they had a burnt offering. I don't know if I should say this very fast. They would kill an animal and burn it, and that would be the offering. That was the burnt offering. And then they had the grain offering, which was basically grain, and it would get burned as well. And then they had the fellowship offering, where they would kill an animal and burn it. And then they had the sin offering, where they would kill an animal and burn it. Which one of these offerings do you think I have brought with me this morning? Ellen. The grain offering. You don't think I've brought a calf and we're going to start another one. I think you're, you're very wise. Okay, so the grain offering. I have the basic version of the grain offering. I read this all out to you just, uh, just a few minutes ago. So, the grain offering. <laughs> we, sort of, this is, there's less of this. So this is flour. I'm not sure if they use self-raising flour, but we have flour for the grain offering, so that's great. So we've got that. We've got olive oil. Uh, again, Sainsbury's, we're clearly a Sainsbury's family. And uh, we have got, I don't have any incense. Does anybody have any incense with them? No? Nobody? I don't? don't know what you were thinking this morning when you were getting ready. Well, so I brought this. <coughs> Do I make what now? And, um... So there's a cinnamon, so I'm going to pass this around and let everybody smell this. Because the thing about incense was it had a really, now not everybody likes the smell of cinnamon, but it had a really nice <coughs> smell. So, right. So what we're going to do is, we're going to get this bowl, these flowers on. Right, so, here's our bowl. We're going to put in our flour, more or less, sort of. We're going to put in our olive oil, more or less, sort of. Oh, you guys don't smell it yet. <coughs> it has to go all the way to Eliana. See what Eliana thinks of cinnamon. Do you like that smell? Is it a nice smell? No. No, no it's a nice yeah. smell. Maybe it's one you like as you get older. Apparently, Brussels right? we get to like them more when you get older, just to let you know. I know, I know, weird. Okay, so I'm putting in my incense as well. And then we're almost ready to start the burning. But there was one more thing, if you were listening carefully to my reading. What was the other thing that's needed? You have to burn it? What else? I haven't really got this, but there was another ingredient I talked about towards the end. Um, salt. Oh my goodness, you're on the ball. Yes, salt. So we've got some salt which is spar, and we're going to put that in. And now, are we all ready for the burning? Who all thinks I should burn it? <laughs> Joy thinks we should burn it. Who all, think, oh, my Who all thinks that we should not burn it? Get the ear eyes. None of the adults, the adults are all fine. You don't want me to set fire to the front of the church? No. <laughs> you don't want me to set fire to the front of the church? You think that would be a bad thing? Yeah. Okay, well, I think we're going to have to take a vote on this, but I think it's going to have to be a whole church thing. <laughs> so, who thinks I should burn? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's, I'm going to say about 12 or 15, let's say that, right? Who thinks I shouldn't burn? Oh, Joy, I forgot to point you in the earlier one, 16. <laughs> Okay, the gallery don't care. <laughs> Let it be noted for the future, the gallery there are happy for me to do it. Anna cares. Which way did you vote? Don't, don't, don't burn. burn. Okay, hands up again for the no burning. Yeah. Do you know that's tight enough? Yeah. <laughs> but I think the balance is that we're not going to.
to set this on fire. Yeah. Oh, I know. I'm devastated too. I have no idea what would happen if we burned olive oil and cinnamon and flour and salt. Genuinely, no idea what would happen. Um, so, people have brought all sorts of things today with them to church. I'm sure there is grain. I'm sure people have brought grain. I can see grain. But we don't do the same with grain as we used to. We don't bring it as an offering to God to to say sorry to God or to ask God for something. We bring an offering to God for harvest to say thank you. And so in the middle of all, how many of you been to any other harvest services? Is this your only harvest service? No, Billy. What other harvest services have you been to? You're not telling me. Do you, do you not do them in school anymore? They haven't happened yet. I used to love arts when I was in school. Like it's my, one of my favourite things. So if you're at any other, yes, Sam. Go to a harvest service in BB. That's really good. I, I wasn't aware of that. Do the GB do a harvest service as well? Oh, that's really good. That's great. So when you're at these harvest services, you're saying thank you for the good things God has done for us. But you're always remembering the most important, the most good thing that God has ever done for us. And what is the most important thing God has ever done for us? Go on, you know that, you know, Andrew. Well, he did, that was really good, but the creation was wonderful. But in, in, to help us when we're feeling bad or we've done something wrong, yes. He saved us. He sent Jesus. Exactly. He saved us. If we trust in him, he will save us and look after us and watch over us. And that is the thing that we are to be thankful for more than anything else in this world. So I am now going to pray for you. And we're going to thank Jesus. Okay, so everybody just... Let's down the hands together and eyes closed. Thank you, Jesus, for all the beautiful things in the world. Thank you for all the plants and animals, all the food we need, and we live in this wonderful place. Thank you. But thank you most of all for giving yourself for us. We are so thankful for that. May all of us be changed by that. We pray in your name. Amen. Okay. Well, I think I quite like keeping you all up at the front when we're singing. Are you happy to all keep singing together? Yeah? No? Ellen, what do you think I should do? Jack, what do you think I should do? Should I send you back to your seat or should I keep you up here? You want us to go back to your seat? Well, we're sort of a democracy up here, so everybody go back to their seats. And when you get back, we're going to sing God Who Made the Earth.
themselves. But your offering is uh, now going to be received. The plates will be passed along, and the choir is going to sing, This is my father's world. Person's back was turned, but I resisted. 
Um, but it sort of sent me to away from Leviticus chapter 2 into the slightly more intense Leviticus chapter 1. So I'm going to read uh, a few verses from Leviticus chapter 1. So we're still on page 102 in the Pew Bible. And I have uh, a very slight warning before this, but you're all tough, I think. The Lord called to Moses, verse 1, and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. He said, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when anyone among you brings an offering to the Lord, bring as your offering an animal from either the herd or the flock. He later makes you actually bring birds and things later on, but anyway, the herd or the flock. If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, you're to offer a meal without defect. You must present it at the entrance of the tent of meeting so it will be acceptable to the Lord. You're to lay your hand on the head of the burnt offering and it will be accepted on your behalf to make atonement for you. You're to slaughter the young bull before the Lord and then Aaron's sons, the priest, shall bring the blood and splash it against the sides of the altar at the entrance to the tent of meeting. You're to skin the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. The sons of Aaron, the priest, are to put fire on the altar and arrange wood on the fire. Then Aaron's sons, the priest, shall arrange the pieces, including the head and the fat, on the wood that is burning on the altar. You're to wash the internal organs and the legs with water, and the priest is to burn all of it on the altar. It is a burnt offering. It's a food offering. It's an aroma pleasing to the Lord. This is God's word. Just for this, can I have a picture of the tabernacle actually up on the screen? It's just as handy to kind of have. My slightly blurry tabernacle picture. There's always been a problem in our relationship with God. Right, right from the Garden of Eden. There has been this gulf between us we are unable to cross. We cannot make ourselves good enough for God. We don't have it in us. And there was a comparison once made. We, we might manage to be so good that we can climb a mountain like Kilimanjaro or Everest. But the goodness we need to achieve is reaching the stars. And we are never going to be able to do that. And God, who is perfect and holy, he cannot just pretend everything's okay with us. So something has to be done to bridge the gap between us. And in many ways, the Old Testament is the story of the children of Israel um, and their search to see this gap bridge and their search to be in God's presence. It was true then, and it is true some five or six thousand years later. For us now. But when the, when the, um, at the time of the tabernacle, the children of Israel had been led out of Egypt into freedom and were promised the promised land. They were on this journey to get to the promised land. But the question still remained with them, how can a fallen, broken person relate to a holy God? Well, during these years, some of the answers began to be provided. God rescues his people from slavery, and they all head out into the desert where God reminds them of the promises he made to their ancestor Abraham. He promises to be their God. He promises to always look after them. He says he's going to fight all their battles and win all their wars. He's going to take them to this land flowing with milk and honey and everything is going to be wonderful. Those are the promises God is making to them. And they have seen God do all these amazing things. Rescue them from Egypt rescue them from Pharaoh. He's been leading them and feeding them and they have this wonderful promise of this land flowing with milk and honey ahead of them. But God wants to give them a few rules to live by. They just need a few, a few guidelines. Things like, well stronger than guidelines, laws. Things like, be nice to your parents. Do not steal. Do not kill. Do not worship any other gods before me. I mean, you wonder that they would need to do not worship any other gods before me. Look at everything God has done for them. How could they ever want to worship anyone else? Clearly, this is the one true God who's looking after them. But when Moses is up on Mount Sinai getting the rules for life, we call them the Ten Commandments, people got fed up wailing. And with Moses' brother Aaron, they built a golden calf. So one month, quite literally, they are declaring their
deserve forever faithfulness to God as their one true God and they are loving his plans for them and they are promising they will always be his people and the very next month this is what they say to Aaron come make us gods who will go before us as for this fellow Moses Aaron's brother as for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt we don't know what's happened to him then they worship the golden calf declaring these are your gods Israel who brought you up out of Egypt and we see this all through Israel's history from here right on down through to the time Jesus himself comes into the world this tendency to turn away from God it's almost as if they're saying yes God we do see you there and we think you've done some, some decent things for us and we like that about you, we like what you do for us, but we also just really want to do our own thing. So that's what we're really going to focus on. Um, I, I uh, was uh, talking about this uh, previously, last week, about this tendency my car has to veer to the left. I've had a lot of stick since then. So apparently my car is not meant to veer to the left and it needs aligned, realigned. But I feel every single car I've had has veered to the left. So this is obviously something for me to investigate. So I'm not going to assume your cars do this, like I did previously. Let's just talk about my car. And it has this tendency to veer to the left. If I don't keep my hands firmly on the steering wheel, eventually I'll just start drifting. I mean, the road is there, but left to itself, the car will veer away. If I didn't keep correcting it, it would end up in a ditch. Well, I don't want my own car, the only car in the country that veers to the left, I don't want my car to end up in a ditch, and God did not want his people to end up in a ditch. He has really big plans for them. He has massive plans for them. And so he has to at least keep them. Maybe not always on the street or narrow, but at least on the road itself. So to help with that, when Moses has been getting the Ten Commandments, God has also been giving them really detailed plans for this tabernacle, and eventually they will have a temple in Jerusalem. The tabernacle is a place where they are meant to worship, and near the entrance to the tabernacle there is an altar. And that was where when people messed up, they could come to make things right with God, even if they've accidentally done something wrong, they could bring a sacrifice and God would forgive them. There's a lot of these offerings. I listed a few of them with the children and really all of them were needed to keep the relationship with God good and healthy and to keep the children of Israel on the right path, on the right road. So let's take the burnt offering as an example. A person would become aware of sin in their lives and they would want to make things right with God. So they would choose a meal from their herd or their flock and I'm sure there's many different reasons for choosing a meal, but one was that the male animals were regarded as being of less value. They ate a lot less meat in those days, and so the male animals could sometimes be a wee bit redundant. So choosing a male animal made it easier for the family bringing the offering. It had to be a perfect meal. You couldn't take the really weak one from the herd, the one with the broken leg that was about to die. It had to be a healthy and a thriving animal, the best you had. And it had to be yours, you couldn't go grab somebody else's animal. You would bring the animal to the tabernacle and then you would place your hand on his head. And in a world of sacrifices and blood like this, you can imagine people would not have been terribly sentimental. It was a rough, tough enough kind of world. But still, they had to place their hand on the head of the animal and maybe look the animal in the eyes or try to avoid looking the animal in the eyes and know that by doing this, they were setting the animal apart to die in their place, to die for them. More than that, you couldn't hand the animal over to the priest and say, right lads, could you do that? That'd be great, thanks very much. Here's Billy the calf. And uh, yeah, we've, we've done, we've, I've laid my hands on his head, he's happy with the whole process, he's good to go. Go, go easy on them. No, you had to participate. You had to do it yourself. You had to prepare the animal as described in the passage. Washing it and making sure it was as perfect as it could be. You were right in the thick of the action. And then the priest would take over. 
All their work was focused on the altar, and that was where blood would be spilled, and the sacrifice would happen, and the smell would rise to the heavens and be accepted by God as his people coming to him, wanting a relationship with him, wanting to worship him. So we can begin to see how relationship would be restored between fallen human beings and God. You were to bring a gift that cost you something. The gift had to be perfect, and the bringer of the gift had to be right in the heart of things, right in the middle of the action. But the problem was the sacrifices had to keep being offered. Day after day, and year after year, and century after century, and the people they didn't get any better. They probably got worse. I mean, it was up and down, but over time, pretty much they got worse. The sacrifices were intended as an ongoing reminder of sin and separation and the reality of what is happening in this world between us and the God who made us. But eventually the people seem to forget what the sacrifices were for and why they were doing them. They turn up every now and again, they show their face, they bring an animal, but their hearts were not in it. There was no real desire for forgiveness or for reconciliation. Hebrews 10, we read, it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So what could be done? Was there no lasting way of being reconciled to the God who made us? Well, God did have a better way. But he wanted to give his people time to grow and be strong. He wanted to understand their need of him and how he was caring for them. He wanted them to be so familiar with the sacrifices that when the real sacrifice came, they would recognize that here was the real sacrifice. That all the others had just been pointing towards this perfect meal. That here their sins could finally and forever be taken away. Because God was going to provide the perfect meal without any defect. He was going to be the substitute for us. The one that God sent wasn't going to be sacrificed on an altar, but on a cross. His bones were broken and his blood shed, and his suffering was not over in an instant, but was enough to take on the pain of all humanity and the broken world that we live in. He bore it all in his body on the tree. And through him we can be saved. Through the blood of the God who made us. We can be reconciled and forgiven and made safe forever if we can just put our hand on his head and look into his eyes and thank him for dying in our place. Everything in the Old Testament pointed towards this coming of the greater sacrifice, the great sacrifice, the once and for all, never has to be done again sacrifice, the perfect Lamb of God purifying us from all sin by shedding his blood. We can all fall in to just attending the sacrifices. But we can miss the point of the great and once for all sacrifice when God son and came and gave his life for us. As we thank him this harvest time for his goodness to us, his generosity, his bounty, that we have food on the table and food in the cupboard, that we are not scared of running out of food in the next day or the next week, as we remember how good he is to us in his generosity and kindness. Let us remember his goodness in giving us everything, in giving us himself, and that we all have a choice to make in how we respond to his gift. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for Jesus, Lord. We are so thankful that we can look back and thank you and, and trust him and put all our faith in him and know that we are safe in him. And we are thankful, Lord, that people before Jesus were able to look forward through the sacrifices and through your word, Lord that they were able to know about you and to come to you in trust and faith. It's just they had to keep coming to you. So Lord, we thank you for your love for us, your interest in us, 
your ongoing patience in working with us. Lord, bless us this harvest time and help, uh, help us to be a really thankful people. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, in closing, we are going to sing very appropriately, Come, we thankful people, come.